From around the globe, it's theCUBE, with digital coverage of MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi everybody, this is Dave Vellante and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of the MIT CDO IQ 2020 event. Of course, it's gone virtual. Uh, we wish we were all together in, in Cambridge. They were going to move into a new building this year for years. They've, they've done this event at the, the Tang Center, uh, moving into a new facility, but you know, unfortunately it's going to have to wait at least a year, we'll see. But we've got a great guest nonetheless. Doug Laney is here. He's a business value strategist, a best-selling author, an analyst, a consultant, and a longtime uh, CUBE friend. Doug, great to see you again. Thanks so much for coming on. Dave, great, great to be with you again as well. So I got to ask you, I mean, you have been an advocate for obviously measuring the value of data, the CDO role. I, I don't take this the wrong way, but I, I feel like the last 150 days have done more to sort of accelerate people's attention on the importance of data and the value of data yeah. than all the great work that you've done. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> uh, it's always great when people, when organizations actually take advantage of some of these these concepts of of uh, data data value, uh, you may be speaking specifically about the situation with United Airlines and American Airlines, where they have basically collateralized their customer loyalty data, their customer loyalty programs, to the tunes of several billion dollars each. Um, so, uh, and one of the things that's very interesting about that is that the the third party valuations of their customer loyalty data resulted in numbers that were larger than the companies themselves. So basically the value of their data, which is, you know, as we've discussed previously off balance sheet, um, is more valuable than the market cap of those companies themselves, which is just incredibly fascinating. Well, and, and of course, all you have to do is look to the trillionaires club. And now of course, Apple pushing two trillion right, to, right. to really see sort of the, the value that the market places on data. But, but the other thing is, of course, COVID. I mean, everybody talks about the COVID acceleration. How have you seen it impact uh, the awareness of the importance of, of data, whether it applies to business resiliency or even new monetization models? I mean, if you're not digital, you can't do business. Yeah. And digital is all about data. Yeah. I think it, the major challenge that most organizations are seeing um, from, a, from a kind of a data and analytics perspective due to COVID is that their traditional trend-based forecast models are broken. Hmm. If you're a company that's only forecasting based on your own historical data um, and not taking into consideration or even identifying what are the leading indicators of your business, then COVID and the, you know, the economic sh shutdown or slowdown um, ha have entirely broken those models. So it's raised the awareness of companies to say, hey, what, what, what can we, how can we predict our business now? We can't do it based on historical, our own historical data. We need to look externally at what are those you know, external, maybe global indicators or other kinds of markets that precede our, our own forecast, our, our own activity. And um, so the conversion from trend-based forecast models to uh, what we call driver-based forecast models isn't easy for a lot of organizations to do. And one of the more difficult parts is identifying what are those external data factors from suppliers, from customers, from partners, from competitors, um, from complementary products and services that are leading indicators of your, your business. And, th and then recasting those models and executing on them. I mean, that's a great point. If you think about mm -hmm. you know, COVID and how it's changed things, I mean, the, everything's changed, right? The ideal customer profile has changed. Uh, yeah. the, your value proposition to those customers has completely changed. You got you to rethink that. And of course, it's very hard to predict if mm -hmm. and when you know, this thing eventually comes back, you know, some kind of hybrid mode. You, know, you used to be selling to people in, a, in an office environment. That's right. obviously changed. There's, there's a lot that's, that's permanent there. And, and you know, data is potentially at least the, uh, the, the forward indicator, the canary in the coal mine. Right, it also is the product and service. So not only can it help you um, and improve your forecasting models, but it can become a, a product or a service that you're, that you're offering. I mean, look at us right now, we would you know, generally be face-to-face -face and person-to-person, -person, but we're using video technology to transfer um, you know, this, this content. Um, and then one of the things that I, it took me a while to, to, to uh, realize, but 
a couple of months after the, the, the COVID shutdown, it occurred to me that it, even as a consulting organization, you know, Caserta focuses on, on North America, but um, the reality is that every consultancy is now a global consultancy because we're all doing business remotely. So there are no particular, you know, or, or certain, um, th there are no particular or, or real strong um, localization issues for uh, doing consulting today. So we talked a lot over the, the years about the role of the CDO, how it's evolved, how it's changed. Of course, it, you know, the, the early, the kind of pre-title days, it was kind of mm -hmm. coming out of a, a data quality world, and that's still, still vital. Uh, of course, it's, it's, you know, as we heard today from the keynote, it's much more public, <laughs> much more exposed, mm -hmm. different public data sources, but, but the, the role has certainly evolved uh, initially into uh, regulated industries like financial, healthcare, and government, but now mm -hmm. pretty much you know, many, many more organizations have a CDO. My understanding is that you're giving a talk in the business case for the, for the CDO. Help us understand that. Yeah, so one of the things that we've been, been doing here for the last couple of years is uh, running an ongoing study of how organizations are um, kind of impacted by the role of the CDO. And, and really it's more of kind of a correlation and looking at what are some of the qualities of, of organizations that have a CDO or don't have a CDO. So some of the things we found is that organizations with a, a CDO nearly twice as often mention the importance of data and analytics in their, in their annual report. Um, organizations with a, a, a C-level CDO, meaning a, a true executive, um, are four times more often uh, to be uh, likely to be using data to transform the, the business. Um, and, and, you know, when we're talking about using uh, data and advanced analytics, we found that organizations with a CIO, not a CDO, responsible for their data assets are only half as likely to be doing advanced analytics in any way. So there are a number of, of interesting things that we found about companies that have a CDO and how they operate uh, a bit differently. You know, I want to ask you about that. You mentioned the CIO mm -hmm. and we've seen, we're, we're increasingly seeing, you know, lines of reporting and, and, and peer reporting alter, shift, the sands are shifting a little bit. Mm -hmm. We've seen, you know, in the early days, this, the CDO, and still predominantly, I think, is sort of an independent organization. We've seen a few cases and in, in increasingly number where they're reporting into the CIO. We've seen the same thing, by the way, with the, the chief information security officer, which used to be yeah. considered the fox watching the hen house. So we're seeing those shifts. We've also seen the CDO become you know, more aligned with a, te a technical role, sometimes even emerging out of that technical role. Yeah, I, I think the, I don't know, what I'm seeing more is that the C CDOs are emerging from the business. Companies are realizing that data is a business asset, it's not an IT T asset. <clears throat> there was a time when data was tightly coupled with applications and technologies, but today, you know, data is very easily decoupled from those applications and usable in a wider variety of contexts. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, you know, as, as, as data gets recognized as a business, not an IT asset, you want somebody from the business uh, responsible for overseeing that, that asset. Yes, a lot of CDOs still report to the CIO, uh, but increasingly more CDOs are you're, you're seeing, and I think you'll see some other surveys from other organizations this week, where the C CDOs are, are more frequently reporting up to the CEO level, meaning they're, they're true, um, they are true executives. You know, I, I've long advocated for the bifurcation of the IT organization into separate I and T organizations. Again, there's no reason other than <clears throat> for historical purposes to keep the data and, and technology sides of the, uh, the organizations um, you know, so intertwined. Well, it certainly makes sense that the chief data officer would have an affinity with the lines of business. And, and you're seeing a lot of organizations really trying to streamline their, their data pipeline, their data life cycles, uh, bring that together, you know, infuse intelligence into that, but also have a system, take a systems view and really have the business be intimately involved, if not even own, you know, the data. You see a lot of emphasis on self-serve, what are you seeing in terms of that sort of data pipeline or, or, or the data life cycle, if you will, that used to be kind of, you know, wonky, yeah. hardcore techies, right. uh, but now really involving a lot more constituents? Yeah, well, the data life cycle used to be somewhat short. Um, yeah. uh, when we look at the data life cycles, they're, they're, more, they're longer um, and they're more kind of a data networks than, than a life cycle and, mm -hmm. or a supply chain. And, uh, 
the reason is that companies are finding alternative uses for their data, not just um, uh, using it for a single operational purpose or perhaps a, uh, a reporting purpose, but finding that there are new value streams that can be generated from data. There are value streams that can be generated internally. There are a variety of value streams that can be generated externally. So we work with companies to identify what are those you know, variety of, of value streams um, and then uh, uh, kind of test their feasibility. Are they ethically feasible? Are they legally feasible? Are they economically feasible? Can they scale? Do you have the technology capabilities? And so we'll run through a process of, um, of assessing the ideas that are generated. Um, and, uh, but but the, you know, the bottom line is that companies are realizing that data is an asset. It needs to be not just you know, measured as one and managed as one, but also monetized uh, as an asset. And uh, you know, as we've talked about previously, data has these unique qualities that it can be used over and over again, and it can mm. be uh, generate more data when you use it, and it can be used simultaneously for multiple purposes. So companies like you mentioned, like Apple and, and others, have have built business models based on these you know these unique qualities of, of data. But I think it's really incumbent upon any organization today to to do so as well. Well, when you observe those companies that that we talk about all the time, mm. the, the sort of Data is at the center of their organization, sure. and you know they maybe put people around that data. That's got to be one of the challenge for, for many of the incumbents. Is everybody talks about the, the data silos, uh, the the different standards, different data quality. That that's got to be yeah. a fairly major blocker for people becoming a quote unquote data driven organization. It is because some organizations were you know developed as people driven or product driven or brand driven or mm -hmm. you know other things, and to try to convert to becoming data driven take a high degree of data literacy or fluency, and I think there'll be a lot of talk about that this week. Um, I'll, I'll certainly mention it as well. And so getting the organization to become data fluent and appreciate data as an asset and understand its possibilities and the, the art of the possible with data, it's, it's, a, it's a long road. Um, and um, yeah, so the, the culture change that goes along with it is, is really difficult. Listen, we're working with a you know 150 year old consumer brand right now <laughs> that wants to become more more data driven, and they're they're very product driven. And you know we hear the CIO say, um, you know we, we want people to understand that we're a <clears throat> we're a data company that just happens to produce you know this product. We're not a product company that generates data. And once we realize that and start behaving in that fashion, then we'll be able to. Um, to, to really win and, and thrive in our marketplace. So uh, one of the key roles of a chief data officer is to understand how data affects the monetization of mm -hmm. you know, an organization. You know, obviously there are for-profit companies, mm -hmm. if you're a healthcare organization, it's you know, saving lives, and obviously you know, being profitable as well, or at least staying within the budget, depending upon the structure of the organization. Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of people, I think, Oftentimes misunderstand that as like, okay, do I have to become a data broker? Am I selling data directly? But I think, right. I think you, you kind of pointed out many times that, that and you just did that, that data is unlike oil. That's why we don't you know, like that data right. is the new oil uh, analogy because it's, nope. it's so much more valuable and can be used. It doesn't follow yes, the laws right. of scarcity. But, but what are you finding just in terms of people's uh, application of that notion of monetization, you know, cutting costs, mm -hmm. increasing revenue? You know, how, what are you seeing in the field? What's that spectrum yeah. look like? So uh, one of the things I've done over the years is compile a, a kind of a library of hundreds and hundreds of examples of how organizations are using data and analytics in innovative ways. And I have a kind of a book in a process that hopefully will be out this fall, um, sharing a number of those, you know, inspirational examples. Um, so, um, you know, that's the, the kind of thing that, that organizations need to understand is that there are a variety of, of great examples out there and they shouldn't just necessarily look to their own industry. There are inspirational examples from, um, from other industries as well. You know, many um, clients come to me and they, they ask, uh, you know, what are others in my industry doing? And my, my flippant response to that is, you know, why do you want to be in second place or third place? Well, you know, why not take an idea from another industry, perhaps a digital you know, product company, and apply that to your your own your own business, but yeah, like you mentioned, there are a variety of ways to monetize data. It doesn't involve necessarily selling it. Um, you can deliver analytics. Uh, you can report on it. You can use it internally to generate um, in, improved business process performance. And as long as you're measuring um, how data is being applied and, and what its impact is, then you can you know then you're in a position to claim that you're you're monetizing it. But if you're not measuring the impact of data on business processes um, or on uh, customer relationships or 
um, or partner or supplier relationships or anything else, then it's difficult to claim that you're you're monetizing it. But um, one of the more interesting ways that we've been working with organizations to monetize their data, certainly in light of GDPR and the California you know, Privacy Consumer Privacy Act, um, where you, you know I can't sell you my data anymore, but we've identified uh, ways to monetize your customer data in a couple of ways. One is to synthesize the data, create synthetic data sets that retain the original statistical kind of anomalies in the in the data or you know, features of the data, but don't share actually any any PII. But another interesting way that we've been um, working with organizations to monetize their data is what I call um, inverted data monetization, where, again, I can't share my customer data with you, but I can share information about your products and services with my customers and take a you know, referral fee or a commission you know, based on that. So let's say I'm a hospital and, um, and uh, I can't sell you my patient data, of course, due to a variety of regulations. But I can sell, I know who my, say, who my diabetes patients are, and I can introduce them to your healthy meal plans, to your gym memberships, to your uh, at-home glucose monitoring kits, and again, take a kind of a referral fee or, or a cut, cut, of that, um, cut of that action. So we're, we're working with customers in the financial services firm uh, industry and, um, and in the healthcare industry on, uh, on just those kinds of examples. And we've identified tens, hundreds of millions of dollars of incremental value for organizations that uh, from their data that they they you know were just kind of sitting on. Interesting. I, I called you yep. a business value strategist at the top. Where do you see you know where in the S curve do you see you're able to have the biggest impact? I mean, I doubt that you enter organizations where you say, oh, they've got it all figured out. They can't you know, use my advice. Right. But 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 as well, it, you know, sometimes in the early stages, yeah. you, you may not be able to have as big of an impact because there's not top down support or whatever, there's too, you know, too much you know, technical debt, et cetera. Where are you finding you can have the biggest impact out of that? Generally, we don't come in and, and run those kinds of data monetization or information innovation exercises unless there's some degree of, you know, of exe executive support. Um, I've never done that at a, at, at a lower level, but certainly there are um, you know, lower level, more kind of immediate and vocational um, opportunities for data to deliver value through just simply, you know, analytics. Um, you know, one of the, the simple examples I, I give is, uh, you know, I sold a, a home recently, and uh, when you put your house on the market, everybody, you know, comes out of the woodwork, the fly-by-night, you know, uh, mortgage companies, the moving companies, the box companies, the painters, the landscapers all know you're moving because your data's in the, uh, in the US in the MLS directory. And um, it was interesting, the only company that didn't reach out to me was my own bank, you know, and so <laughs> they lost kind of the opportunity to um, introduce me to a mortgage, to retain me as a client, to introduce me to my new branch, print me new checks, move the stuff in my safe deposit box, all of that. They missed a, a, a simple opportunity. And I'm thinking, you know, this doesn't require rocket science to figure out which of your customers are moving. You know, the MLS database, you know, or, or you can harvest it from Zillow or, or you know, other sites. Um, is basically public domain data. And I was just thinking how, you know, stupid simple would it have been for them to, you know, hire, uh, you know, a high school programmer, give them a can of Red Bull and say, listen, you know, match the customer, our customer database to the MLS database to let us know who's moving on a daily or weekly basis. Um, it, some of these solutions are pretty, pretty simple. So is that, is that part of what you do come in with just like hardcore tactical ideas like that, but you're also doing strategy? I mean. Tell, tell me more uh, about how you're spending your time. I, I try to take more of a broader approach where we look at the data itself. And, you know, again, people have said, if you torture it enough, what would it tell us? <laughs> we kind of take that angle. We look at examples of how or other organizations have monetized data and, and think about how to apply those uh, and adapt those ideas to the, the, comp the company's own business. We look at kind of key business drivers internally and externally. We look at um, uh, kind of edge cases uh, for their, their customers' businesses. Um, we run through some hypothesis generating activities. Um, there are a variety of different kinds of activities that we, we do to generate ideas. And most of the time when we run these workshops, which last a week or two, um, we'll end up generating anywhere from 35 to 50 pretty solid ideas for generating new value streams from data. So when we talk about monetizing data, that's what we mean, generating you know, new value streams. Um, but like I said, then the next step is to go through kind of that feasibility assessment and determine which of these ideas you, you actually want to pursue. So you're, of course, a longtime industry watcher as well. You know, as a former Gartner analyst, you kind of have to be. My yeah. question is, you know, if I think back, uh, you know, I've been around a while. If I, if I think back at like the peak of Microsoft's, you know, prominence in the PC era, it was like 1990, right. Windows 95, and you felt yeah. like, wow, Microsoft is just so strong. 
And then of course mm-hmm. Linux comes along and you know a lot of open source changes and, and lo and behold, a whole new you know, set of leaders emerges. And you kind of see the same thing today with the, the, the Trillionaires Club and you feel like, wow, even COVID yeah. has been a tailwind for them. But you think about, okay, where could the disruption come to these yeah. you know, large players that own huge clouds, they have all the data, uh, is data potentially a, a disruptor for these what appear to be insurmountable odds against the yeah. against the the newbies? Um, there, there's always people coming up with new ways to leverage data or new sources of data to capture. Um, so yeah, they're certainly not going to be around for, forever. But it's been really fascinating to see the transformation of some companies. Like uh, I think nobody really kind of exemplifies it more than than IBM, where they. They emerged from you know, originally uh, selling meat slicers, right? The Dayton meat slicer was their original <laughs> product, right? And then they evolved into you know, uh, manual business machines and then electronic business machines. And then they, they dominated that. Then they dominated the kind of the software, early uh, mainframe software industry. Then they dominated the, the PC industry. Then they dominated the services industry to some degree. And so, you know, they're starting to get into data. And um, you know, I think you, you know, following that kind of trajectory is something that really any organization should be looking at. You know, when do you actually become a data company, not just a, a, a product company or a service company or, um, uh, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we have uh, Inder, Inderpal Bandari is one of our Q mm-hmm. guests here. He's the chief sure. data officer of IBM, you know him well. And, and yeah. he talks about it, the, the journey that, that he's undertaken mm-hmm. to, to transform the company into a data company. I think a lot of people don't really realize mm-hmm. what's actually going on behind the scenes, whether it's you know, financially oriented or mm-hmm. new revenue opportunities. But, but with you know, one of the things he stressed to me uh, in mm-hmm. our interview was that the, on average, they're reducing the end-to-end uh, cycle time from you know, mm-hmm. raw data to insights by 70%, that, on average. And, and that's just an enormous, you know, for a company that size, it's just enormous cost savings or revenue generating opportunity. Yeah, there's no doubt that the technology behind data pipelines is improving and the, the process from moving data to those, from, from those pipelines directly into um, you know, predictive or diagnostic or, or prescriptive output um, is a lot more accelerated than the early days of data warehousing. Is, is the skills barrier is acute? I mean, it seems like it's, it's lessened somewhat. You know, the early Hadoop days you needed, you know, the, even data scientists. Is, uh, is there still just a massive skills shortage or are we start to, uh, starting to attack that? Well, I think companies are figuring out a way around the skill shortage by doing things like self-service analytics and, um, um, focusing on more kind of easy to use mainstream type um, you know, AI or advanced analytics technologies, but uh, there's still a, a very much a, a need for um, uh, um, for, for data scientists and in, in organizations and, and a difficulty in in finding people that are true data scientists. You know, there's no real kind of certification, and so um, really anybody can call themselves a data scientist. But I think companies are getting good at interviewing and and determining whether somebody's got the, got the goods or not. But then so, there are other types of skills that we don't really focus on, like the data engineering skills. Um, there's still a, a huge need for, for data engineering. You know, data doesn't self-organize. Um, you know, you can, there are some uh, augmented analytics technologies that will automatically generate analytic output, but there really aren't technologies that automatically kind of self-organize data. And so uh, there, there's a huge need for, um, for, for data engineers. And then, as we talked about, there's a, a large interest in external data um, and harvesting that and ingesting it and even identifying what external data is out there. So one of the emerging roles that we're seeing, if not you know, the sexiest role of the 21st century, uh, is the role of the data curator, somebody who kind of acts as a librarian, um, identifying external data assets that are potentially valuable, um, testing them, evaluating them, negotiating, um, and then figuring out how to ingest that, that data. So I think that's a really important role for an organization to have. You know, most companies have an entire department that procures, you know, da- uh, procures office supplies, but they don't have anybody who's procuring data supplies. And when you think about you know, which is more valuable to an organization, how do you not have somebody who's dedicated to identifying the world of external data assets that are out there? You know, there are 10 million data sets published by government organizations and NGOs. There are thousands and thousands of data brokers. Um, 
um, aggregating and sharing data. There's uh, web content that can be harvested. There's data from your partners and suppliers. There's uh, data from social media. So to not have somebody who's on top of all that is, is uh, I think, a, a, a gross, uh, it demonstrates gross negligence by the organization. Uh, that is such an enlightening point, Doug. I, my last yeah. question is, I wonder how, if you could share with us how the pandemic has affected your your business personally. I mean, as a consultant, you're on the road yeah. a lot, obviously not on the road so much. You're doing a lot of chalk talks, et cetera. How, yeah. how have you managed through this and, and how have you been able to maintain your you know efficacy with your clients? Um, you know, most of our clients, given that they're kind of in the digital world a, a bit already, um, made the switch pretty quick. Some of them took a, a month or two, but some, th some things went on hold. Um, but we're still seeing the same level of enthusiasm for for data and, and doing things with data. In fact, um, some companies have kind of taken our our advice that data could be their best defense um, in a, in a crisis like this. Um, you know, it's affected our business and it's enabled us to do much more uh, international work um, more easily than than we used to. Um, and I probably spend a lot less time on planes, so it gives me more time for kind of writing and speaking and, and actually doing consulting. So um, that's, that's, that's been nice as well. Yeah, there is that bonus. You know, obviously the Cube <laughs> is not doing physical events anymore, but hey, yeah. we've got two studios operating. And Doug Laney, really appreciate your coming on. Good on you. Always a great guest and sharing your insights and, and have, a, have a great MIT CDO IQ. Thanks, you too, Dave, take care. Cheers. Thanks, Doug. All right, and thank you everybody for watching. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE, our continuous coverage of the MIT Chief Data Officer Conference, MIT CDO IQ. We're right back right after this short break.